So my talk uh, is about the quick and the dead and open source foundations in the age of the kingmakers. Um, and basically, uh, it's actually not, there'll be parts that are a rant, but it's a kindler, gentler version of the talk I gave a year and a half at Monkey, a year ago, a year and a half ago at Monkey Gras with, uh, with some updates. And um, one of the things that sort of, to put this into context, one of the things you need to know about my personality is that I am sort of the heart of an optimist married to the head of a bitter cynic. Okay, so, <laughs> so I'm Canadian, yeah, okay, so. <laughs> it comes, you know, sort of like the, sort of the American meets British, you know. I'll let you decide which side is which. Um, my day job is I'm the executive director of the Eclipse Foundation, so uh, based on like la yesterday's talk, I am living Alex Payton's dream, right? So uh, nine and a half years ago, I was a VP at Oracle, and I chucked that and became a, um, took on this job, and, which is working for a not-for-profit. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm in any way impoverished, they actually pay me pretty well, but um, I'm definitely making less money with zero upside than I could doing other things. And I do it because I am incredibly passionate about what I do, and I could not imagine doing anything else. And if there's any wish that I could give to any other human on the planet, waking up every morning to get to do something that you are completely in love with is one of the best things that can ever happen to you. Um, so I'm basically stuck in this job until I pry my cold, dead hands off of it. Um, I do have a couple of other hats. Uh, I'm a director on the Open Source Initiative, so that's the organization that um, sort of lays claim to what is open source. Um, I also uh, get to dabble in things like uh, on the executive committee of the JCP process, where I get to see up close and personal big company politics at its worst. Um, and I also am former director and still an observer on the board of Open JDK, which. Uh, which is a, uh, shall we say, a work in, continues to be a work in progress as a community. I'm trying to be nice. And largely this talk is motivated um, around the notion that, you know, in the world of GitHub, do we still need things like open source foundations? What the heck do these things do anyways, and why would I care? Um, unsurprisingly, you will find out that be, um, I run an open source foundation, therefore I think they're actually pretty cool and do very useful things. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and I hope that by the end of this talk you will, you will agree at least, you know, a little bit. And basically this talk is going to be about two, in, in sort of in, really in two parts. And this is, you know, the quick and the dead is like, um, it's really about trying to motivate, you know, what do open source foundations actually do? Um, and why, why are they relevant? And then the second part is that towards the end is just a few things on some, actually, I think quite fundamental changes that we're making at the Eclipse Foundation to stay relevant. Um, because if, you're, if you are any institution of any kind, doesn't matter if it's open source or anything else on the planet, if you cannot change as the world changes around you, um, then you are going to be in trouble. Um, and you know, I hope you know, maybe we'll stir some conversation, but I hope you think that some of the changes that we're making at the Eclipse Foundation um, will help maintain our, our utility and, and relevance to society. But deep down inside, I'm here because two years ago, Steve O'Grady posted something that really pissed me off. <laughs> right? And... I'm quite a picture of Larry Todd. He's more wedding. No, that's a good wedding. I don't know, I found it somewhere. Um, yeah, so he's, hey, he's getting married. He's smiling, he's happy. Uh, Kate, I don't know what you see in him, but... Atta boy, Steve. <laughs> um, and and this, this quote is like, it's like basically, yeah, it was like the most backhanded compliment possible to the point of like, screw you, you know, perceptions, you know, it's all about perception. And other than that, you know, you got nothing. You got nothing, right? Um, I might be going out on a limb to say that I very much disagree with this. <laughs> uh, but, uh, so, and, and hopefully I'll convince a few people in the room. So um, here's a few things, and I'm not going to go through this, this whole list, but th here's a few things that open source foundations bring to the table above and beyond you know, your, favorite, um, open source, uh, your, your favorite open source project that's hosted on some hosting site. And um, 
You know, I think governance is, and I'll talk, touch on this again a little tiny bit, but, you know, the notion of governance um, as being important is something that I think often gets lost in the affection that we all have for rapidly evolving and moving technology. I mean, deep down inside, we're all technologists. We all love it when things come together, things work. I get to use something that wasn't there a couple of days ago, right? But governing something so that it is a level playing field, so that it's a meritocracy, so that it's open, it's transparent, those are hard things to do. And especially if you want to do them for something that provides long-term as opposed to short-term benefit. And so I think governance is one of the most underrated things that, that we have going for us in, in the world of open source foundations. Intellectual property management and so on is, is also obviously very important. But it's the last two that I want to talk about at some length um, before, we move, before we move on. And that's around um, sustainability and vendor neutrality. Um, sustainability is the notion that there are some projects that become important enough that you need to think about how are they going to be there for the very long term. Uh, you know, an example that I would give you at the moment, I mean, uh, is uh, Apache Hadoop. I mean, that's a, that's a project that has spawned an industry of big data. And it is, I think, going to be incredibly important for all of us to think about how is that project going to be sustained for decades, potentially. Um, and vendor neutrality, kind of tied back to governance, but vendor neutrality is about the notion that if you really want to have a project take off, and become extremely successful across the industry, oftentimes the best thing you can do for it is to give up control. And I, you know, of course, I think Eclipse is probably one of the uh, earliest and best examples of this because it was started as an IBM project and was an IBM project for a number of years. And IBM really, truly, and honestly did give the Eclipse Foundation a hands-off approach to, su to succeed or fail on its own. But vendor neutrality is also the way that gets more companies rallying around a single technology. Um, and so it's incredibly important to take, if you want to take a technology from something that is being successful to truly something that is going to be an industry platform for the future, the kind of vendor neutrality that you get from communities like Apache and Eclipse are extremely important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some examples um, that I think that are, are pretty interesting around um, focusing on sustainability and vendor neutrality. I think also open source foundations help open source communities tackle bigger problems. Um, and by the way, I know everybody in this room can come up with exceptions to every possible rule here. That's not what I'm, I'm not saying that this is, you know, an, you know, an, an inviolable constraint system by any means. But generally speaking, generally speaking, if you are going to tackle very large problems, um, doing it in a community approach that's vendor neutral and well governed, um, which, whichever community you select for that, um, is, going to help, uh, is going to help. I think a lot of the times the perceptions that we come to um, within the technology community around open source and the perspective that you'd perhaps you know, GitHub is all you would ever need, for example, is really around the notion that when you're a small project, First of all, you have to make a lot of noise to attract attention to your small project. And second of all, it's sort of the law of small numbers, right? It's easy to show velocity or momentum or, uh, around a small project, or it's easier to show velocity, momentum, and adoption around a smaller project sometimes than it is for a really big project. Um, you know, I'd use Eclipse for an example of that. You know, we have literally millions of users and thousands of products that are built on top of Eclipse, most of which we've never met or know nothing about. Um, which is kind of an interesting dilemma. So back to sustainability. Um, and uh, some people who've seen me talk, of, you know, probably have seen this slide to death, uh, but it's always, I think, a great example. A company that we've been working with uh, for quite a few years now is, uh, is Airbus. And Airbus has a, a, is, you know, they're in the business of building airplanes. So they build very complicated systems engineering platforms uh, and they have a, um, a set of constraints that I think very few of us in the technology industry ever think about. 
And that is, I guess this is the air example of the A300. The program began in 1972 and they built them until 2007. So that's 35 years of development and actual um, production. Support on the A300 airframe will last until 2050. If you do the arithmetic, that's 78 years, all right? That's three human generations. How many people in this room have ever written code with the mental mindset that your great granddaughter is going to be maintaining that code? Right, anybody? Because that is such a different mindset from you know, the way that most people think about software um, that it just, it just completely changes the equation on so many levels, right? So, they, and, and by regulation, by law, they need to be able to maintain this software, including the tool chain that produced that software for the entire life cycle, right? That is an incredible liability and obligation. The other interesting number is the A300 only had 23,000 lines of code in it. The A380, which just shipped, had 108 million lines of code, right? So if you think they had a problem with the A300, you ain't seen nothing yet, right? And so this is the kind of sustainability problem um, that, you know, certain, that some companies have to think about. And it's a very, very different equation than getting your favorite JavaScript library up on GitHub. It's just different, right? The next one I want to talk about is something that uh, I'm personally spending a lot of time on and uh, have a, a lot of passion about is, is the Internet of Things. And this is where I'm going to let my, uh, my bitter cynic side show for a while. Um, so bear with me. Because at this moment in time, uh, the Internet of Things is this bright, shiny new toy that everybody talks about in universally glowing terms. What could go wrong? And when you see headlines like this, $14 trillion, right? You know, $8.9 trillion, 212 billion connected things. So what you're going to get out of headlines like that is every shyster, con artist, carpetbagger, and coffee-swilling San Francisco hipster. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping on this bandwagon, right? And by the way, yes, I really do pretty much equate those. Um, so we got, a long, we got a long way to go. Because as we all know, the internet does have a dark side, right? I mean, it's not all, you know, puss in boots out there, as Adobe found out yesterday. Um, and, you know, just to you know, walk through a couple of examples, I mean, you know, Google is currently on trial for uh, violating federal wiretapping laws with Gmail. You know, before Facebook existed, you know, God love us, I have, you know, 40 some odd first cousins and I get to keep tabs with them on, on Facebook in ways that I wouldn't have been able to do easily otherwise. But cyberbullying was not a word uh, before Facebook came along. Um, it just didn't exist as a concept. That's a great contribution to humanity right there. Uh, Facebook recently made headlines in Canada because it's a random um, algorithm for picking uh, pictures of uh, people who have put pictures on Facebook uh, and putting, inserting them into ads, took a picture of this beautiful young woman uh, who had just committed suicide due to cyberbullying and used that in a dating site ad. It was like, so we have a long ways to go before we teach, uh, teach our computers empathy and good taste. I'll let the previous one go, but uh, the case you're talking about there, and I think Google made a pretty good uh, piece of it, but the, uh, the image in question is selected by the advertiser, and also Facebook doesn't select ad sure. images or write them all over the All right. Um, and Twitter, of course, uh, you know, I use Twitter every day, couldn't go by without it. But it, it, it does certainly has its set of pathologies. Um, anybody who, so for example, follows uh, Shanley on Twitter, uh, gets to observe, um, you know, programmer misogynist twits saying outrageous things on a pretty regular basis. Um, so it's into the point here is it's not all it's not all puss in boots out there on the internet, and uh, you know things things can and will go wrong. And of course, then there's this whole thing, right, with the NSA and um, 
<clears throat> try imagining a world where not only can the NSA, you know, read your email and do, a, you know, figure out your social network. They can know where you are at every time, what your heart rate is, which room of the house you're in, blah, blah, blah. And it even gets more interesting. So um, there's definitely a, a downside. And then there's the things. If we're going to talk about the Internet of Things, right? Um, okay, how many, uh, how many people know what this is? Anybody? Right? Okay, the people that saw my talk before. Yeah, um, so this, this is a radiation therapy machine. Um, it's uh, the Ferac 25. Okay, you guys, this is a room full of people who consider themselves professional technologists. How many people in this room know the story of the Ferac 25? That's actually pretty good. It's usually less than that. So for those who don't know, the Ferac 25 is the first device ever proven to have killed people because of a software bug. Um, it was a radiation therapy machine that was in service from 1985 to 1987, uh, built uh, by the Atomic Energy of Canada Limited in Ottawa, and um, it had uh, this really bizarre bug in it that had, where it had like a single byte for a counter in a, in a loop, and in a certain sequence of, uh, of uh, keystrokes would allow it to overflow, put it into a race condition, and given a single dose something in the order of 20,000 rads. Um, so it was, it was pretty brutal. So um, the, thing, the thing about the Internet of Things is things are not benign. Um, and I think really that the whole thing about things is if, you know, my point of view is if, if things are going to be doing um, a lot, being a lot, much more involved in our lives going forward, that it's really important um, that as much of the code in those things is as open source and as free software as possible because any other scenario is a disaster. Um, and I really, uh, so that's one of the things that's motivating me personally to get very involved um, in, in the projects that we've got at Eclipse uh, in this space. And I really, um, you know, that's something that I believe very, very passionately about. Uh, just a brief advertisement, I, what we're trying to do at Eclipse is create a, uh, sort of open source center of gravity around Internet of Things projects, and we're actually doing pretty good so far. We've got, I think we're up to about nine or so. Um, we have the um, uh, different protocols, we have different uh, tools, we have different frameworks, and we have um, a lot of really cool stuff going on. I'd highly encourage people here to, uh, to check it out and to participate, uh, because we're hoping to, uh, we have a pretty cool pipeline of other stuff coming down the pipe. Uh, and uh, we're pretty, uh, pretty excited to see the growth that we've got at Eclipse. And, and they're like, you know, Mosquito is a C server for doing, as, as a broker for MQTT. Uh, so we've got uh, Lua tools. There's, so there's projects in there that are in C, some are in Java, some are in Lua. So it's, it's a, definitely a very diverse community starting up there. And so, like, we believe that open source is the way to go. Um, I want you to... You have to understand that not everybody in the industry thinks that open source is the way to go. Um, I'm not sure how many people have heard this phrase, regulatory capture, but it's a, basically the notion that there are a lot of big companies jockeying for position out there in terms of making sure that whether it's through patents or uh, getting their technology included in standards or the like, uh, but they really want to make sure that they have, you know, they're going to get their enormous pile of the pie. And if you go to meetings for these organizations, it's really good sport. Because um, you'd meet people there that absolutely have no idea what they're going to do. They don't understand what their products are going to be, but they know they're going to make billions. Um, and it's, so it's, it's just a really, uh, really interesting dynamic. And the one thing, one universal thing I, can, I think I can say about the entire industry is that when it comes to developer outreach, there is no sort of technology-centered sector of the economy left that's worse than telcos. Um, they, if, like, there's almost nothing more comical than a developer outreach program from one of these companies, um, generally speaking. There might be the occasional exception, I just haven't found one yet. They're all fairly, they're all quite brutal. They just don't really seem to get it at all. Fortunately for us, we all know that open wins. And uh, with uh, thanks to, uh, again, I got this from Steve uh, some time ago. You know, basically the, uh, the notion, that, or just the example, that here's, you know, back in the old days of uh, SOA versus uh, REST, uh, you know, 
all the big companies were backing SOA, all of them. Um, for those of you that you know, were old enough to remember the XML battles and WS star this, that, and the other thing, um, you know, REST, it was free, it was easy, um, it was available, um, which is actually oftentimes half the battle. He who ships wins. Um, and so, you know, this, the curves speak for themselves, you know, and it, it's the adoption rate, um, despite the fact that there was a very large coalition of very, you know, large and powerful companies that were backing another technology, in the end, the winner became very, very clear. Of course, open source is a very, very, very broad topic. And, you know, when you say open wins, what, what do you mean by, by open? And, um, you know, one of my favorite comedians is, is Jeff Foxworthy. Uh, and, you know, if you can get away with something saying something like, if your family tree has no branches, you might be a redneck, um, and get away and live after saying something like that, then, you know, I think, I think that's pretty good comedy. And, you know, so with apologies to Jeff Foxworthy, a few pathologies to watch out for when it comes to open source is, you know, if your project has no license, it's probably bullshit, right? You know, if your project has no forks, eh, probably, probably bullshit, right? And if your project has only committers from one company, well, I'm sorry, that's probably bullshit too. And, you know, so if, I, if there's one thing that I think that the open source foundations um, out there do a pretty good job about is we do run our projects through the bullshit filter. Um, so I think that's, you know, that alone, I believe, is a valuable service to the broader open source community. Of course, that goes back to the governance thing, right? Um, because we regularly bring projects on board at Eclipse. I think we're, you know, probably averaging something like 8 to 10 a, quarter, a calendar quarter. And there's a lot of pain that goes with bringing them on board because in many cases it was the first time they've actually gone through any kind of open source governance routine and, and actually had their code checked out by people who care about things like, um, you know, what libraries are you using and what mishmash of licenses have you put together and so on. Um, so John O'Bacon, who, by the way, if, you, if you've never read his book, The Art of Community, I, I highly recommend it. It just came out in its second edition not too long ago. Um, love this line, you know, governance does not suck. Um, it is, however, very difficult, and it does cause some impedance mismatch once in a while um, as you're onboarding new projects to a community. Which gets us back to the new kingmakers, um, which is kind of why we're all here. And um, one of the things I want to remember, remind everybody about the, you know, the new kingmakers is, you know, if I was to give a message to young developers today, it would be grow some humility. Um, this says you are the new kingmakers. It doesn't say you are the new kings. Um, and uh, sometimes I think that we sometimes, you know, get confused uh, about the notion that the technology that we're building is so important, so cool, and changing the world so much that we are the new kings of the world, where what we're really doing is enabling the open source community, our companies, our society, our nations, our world a better place. And I think a little humbleness would go a long way, um, you know, um, in, in, in making the world a better place. And it really goes back to, it's not about you. It's about the stakeholders as your project becomes more successful. Um, you know, we all, you know, everybody here who works on an open source project hopes someday that your project is going to be wildly successful and adopted by millions. Right? With great success comes great responsibility. Um, and you have to be able to be humble about the fact that your project has been, is becoming very successful and be willing to give, give even more of yourself back uh, to those stakeholders uh, in your project. Okay, so now I can turn a little bit to what are, what are some of the things that we're changing at Eclipse? Because if it's, you know, the quick and the dead, if we're not changing, if you're, not, if you're standing still, then you're, you're basically on the way to joining the dinosaurs of history. So the first and probably the biggest change that we've brought forward at Eclipse in the last little while is, as of about a couple of weeks ago, you can now host Eclipse projects on GitHub. Um, so that's actually a very big change. We're starting off with new projects that are coming to Eclipse that are already on GitHub. 
Um, but, you know, it doesn't make sense for an open source community to try to compete with a $100 million funded VC backed firm that does nothing but build great tools for developers all day. Um, so now there's a lot of work that goes into this um, that's behind the scenes because as an institution, something like the Eclipse Foundation has to have freedom of action. Right, so it's not just that the projects are hosted at GitHub, we have to make a, figure out a way to make sure that everything gets replicated back to our own servers, so that if GitHub you know, shut us down or went out of business or whatever, the project keeps going. And how we do issue tracking and all that kind of stuff in this, these kinds of scenarios can get pretty complicated. We're st we still have lots of work to do, but the simple fact that you can host an Eclipse project on, on GitHub is, is, I think, a pretty big deal. Uh, the second thing is we changed the definition of what it, uh, what it means to be an Eclipse project to the point where it's basically, if you're willing to, to do, use our development process and follow our IP policy, you're in. We don't care what the technology is any longer. And that's been something that's been constantly evolving since the day I started at the Eclipse Foundation. Um, you know, when it was first, it was, had to be in Java, it had to be a plug-in, right? Then it had to be in Java and it had to be an OSGI bundle that would work with our runtimes. And then so on and so forth to the point where really it's just like, yep, we're ag technology agnostic. If you have a cool project and uh, you, uh, you want to uh, bring it to Eclipse, then uh, please come and talk to us. We implemented a common build infrastructure so that um, all of our projects no longer have to go through all the hassles of doing, building their own uh, build and continuous integration systems. Uh, so a project comes to Eclipse, um, I and mean, right, actually, you know, uh, unfortunately, at this moment, it pretty much only works with our Java projects, um, but um, the idea is that we are going to be able to host not only just straight up builds and release management, but all the infrastructure for doing continuous integration um, at Eclipse. Uh, we're taking all of our processes and putting them through the, the filter of, you know, is every single rule, every single notion that we've got at Eclipse, do we really need to do that? Um, and trying to pare it down as much as, and as absolutely as much as possible. Uh, and we're actually making some very good progress on that. And then finally, uh, probably perhaps not of uh, interest to a lot of people, but we actually have built a long-term support forge for projects at Eclipse. And this goes, goes back to the very early example of Airbus, which is if you're gonna uh, you know, maintain code for a very, very long time, what's all of the infrastructure and process that you need to put together to do that? And again, this is, a, this is a facility that's now freely available for our projects. So if, you know, an Eclipse project that wants to be in a situation of being able to manage its code for, for a very, very long time, um, we, we now have the infrastructure in place to help them do that. Uh, sorry, how does yeah. that differ from your standard infrastructure? Um, it's basically a, a duplicate. Um, so, uh, and, and, the, and the idea is, is that uh, there's, there's a couple of different things. So one is um, uh, the code is going to be maintained there for a very long time, so we don't want to necessarily cloud the day-to-day -day development with branches and so on that are really just there for maintenance and support. So for example, uh, mo but probably 80% of the work that goes on there is backporting of fixes and newer releases to older releases. Uh, the second thing is it's actually it's, it's a benefit of... Uh, of for, for membership as well. Uh, so if you are a company like SAP, just to use an example, that has a, 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 a support team in Bangalore, you know, you can have people working on that forge distinct from the people that are working on the open source forge um, with, different, with different ways to get committer rights, for example. And it, like, so like, let's be, yeah, more details than I wanted to get into, but basically, there's no way to do a long-term support forge without some kind of business model behind it, right? So the idea is, is this is going to be uh, of some benefit to the companies that are building products on top of Eclipse technology, um, so there's, there is a fee for them to, to, to pay into that to support the forge, right? And so, like, in some of these releases, like for the Airbus stuff, the VL, the very long-term support stuff, It'll be like every couple of years, we'll take a snapshot with the notion of we're going to maintain that for on, at least on the order of 20 years. Um, so that's, and don't get me wrong, we are still absolutely learning how to do this. Um, it's not something that is in any way trivial. So beer will change the world. I don't know how, but it will. Um, just a closing thought. Actually, in some ways, I think I do know how the beer is going to change the world. It's going to change the world because of uh, you know events like this and events like we have in the Eclipse community where 
People that are passionate about these kinds of things get together and share a beer and share their dreams and share their technologies. Um, that's how beer is, uh, is going to change the world. And with that, thank you very much. Thank you.